but we also have more of a chance than we've had for over 200,000 years for it not to. So it kind of balances out what could be terrifying once you realize that, oh, we don't have to be terrified because we have the tools. If we had had the 12 code, uh, if we had activated the grids on a 12 code 200,000 years ago, we wouldn't be having this problem right now. Those wormholes wouldn't have be, been made. All of that history, we wouldn't have had to worry about or have to clean up. But we didn't have the D12 frequency available. D12 frequency isn't the most powerful on its own. It's more powerful than those below it. But what it is is the linking frequency that allows us to run what's called the Kirache and the Kundare, which are the Kirache are the primal light field currents from dimension 13, 14, and 15, and the Kundare are the primal sound field currents. This is before sound became light. You have source, and then source created the void, and then in the void there was vibration or sound, and out of the sound came the light. And then out of the light came the dimensions and the world we know down here. So to be able, the most powerful currents are the standing wave patterns of sound that exist in the primal sound fields. We are able, once you can activate D12 frequency in a planetary grid or in your body, it enables you to begin plugging in directly to those eternal light and sound fields. That's what the mission is here at this point. We're going to create what's called a trion field. We've talked about that, that that was just introduced in the Sarasota, Florida workshop, and it was as new, new to me as it was to anybody else, because it literally, they didn't give me any paperwork on that one. I literally had to go through that workshop. It was all in security clearance data, because I guess they knew something was up. That's the, we, we ad, ended up in the middle of a psychotronic attack on the beach that night. But everything was done verbal. They would give me something, I'd be scribbling notes on napkins, work, you know, going through the workshop, and I still don't even have paperwork done for those of you who were there. We're working on getting it done. But at least we have some paperwork this time. What, was, what we're in the middle of is simply anchoring frequencies from the uh, primal light and primal sound fields. They'll anchor through our bodies, if we can activate it in our bodies, which we can't until the grids start activating from what the guardians are doing on parallel Earth and inner Earth, but this is starting. Why we can get this information now? If they gave this to us a year ago, it would be useless. It might have been nice to know <laughs> what the plan was, but the reason we can begin to use the four faces of man grids is because I'll show you over in the corner here. There's a little thing, and you're going to get you'll have a copy of, of this in the packet that's coming. Down here in the corner, it says Earth four faces, and it shows a little cross where they're positioned. One, two, three, four. That's these guys. One, two, three, four. The ones on parallel Earth run on the same axis, but it's actually a 45 degree shift, so one is over here. You have one, two, three, four, and then you have the inner Earth, four faces. There's literally, the, these constructions are on all, in all three of those planets, and there's also a lot more of those head monuments in the other places. They took most of ours down because they were the Ianis, you know, place markers. So it's amazing that the ones over on Easter Island even survived because of all the rating that's been done here. But this one runs on uh, a 45 degree angle, which makes it at this axis. The one for inner Earth would run this way and this way. The one for parallel Earth would run the same, but the numbers would be reversed, like the code, like they all each have different type of frequency coding that would be reversed. And actually this one on parallel Earth would be over where our other point is, where their heads meet on that other side of the globe. That's where this would be on parallel Earth. So that's the access point to this one on parallel Earth. Now, <coughs> I'm sorry. We we were not able to activate any of this. The Guardians couldn't even do it until these two activated. When you look at Earth, parallel Earth, and inner Earth, you have a set of frequency step-downs where it, it goes into the dimensional structure where inner Earth vibrates a little bit higher than Earth, or it has, not vibrates, oscillates a little bit higher than inner Earth, and parallel Earth oscillates a little bit higher than inner Earth. So there's this chain of frequency. It has to start at the highest point and activate going down. So first parallel Earth had to activate its grid, then inner Earth had to activate its grid, and now we can activate ours because the frequencies from these guys on those other planets will now start to, you, you can pull them through now to run into this grid. Normally it would take about 25 years to activate that whole thing because, I mean, if you just blew it into activation really fast, you could blow up the planet by accident. They won't let that happen. We don't have 25 years to activate this grid. So it's going to be activated quickly, but in a balanced way, which means using specific symbols and sequences of mathematical coding to make sure the frequency blend is the right one. 
So each, you know, there'll be parts that will activate. It's not going to be as easy as like, oh, do we have head one done yet? <laughs> you know, it's not going to go like that. It'll be like a piece of this one, and a piece of that one, and a piece of that one will activate. And progressively, we will be able to activate. We need about, they said about 35 to 40 percent of it activated by 2003, by August 12, 2003 if we're going to be able to go through the stellar activation cycle with ma without major messes. So, mm, that, 30, that just came through. 30 to 30, what did I say? 35 to 40 percent? Did I just say that? Okay, that came through so fast. <laughs> I didn't know it was there. <laughs> yeah, they didn't tell me that before. All right. Okay, somebody write that down. Will you, say, will you write that down for me, Michael, so I don't forget that? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, now, we're going to go begin the process of working with this. How this grid will get activated quickly, usually the grid would activate and it would help humans to activate, right? And indigos to activate. Well, you can do it the other way around as well. You can expedite the activation of this by activating humans and indigos, where they're running the frequency and they're putting more of it into the planetary grids. That's what we're going to be doing. And while we do it, we're also going to be progressively creating that, bl that connection a living energy connection between ourselves here, our inner Earth selves, and we're not going to have our parallel Earth selves because they're already evac out, so they're with our inner Earth selves. But we're going to be bringing that trinity of self together through activation of this. There's the corresponding coordinates in our DNA. And I, uh, how this looks in the body, I don't know. I've been asking them, can you, know, can you take the drawing of a body and show where this goes? And I think it's a little more complicated than that. But the coding that corresponds to each mathematical coordinate in the four faces of man grid is also coded in the DNA. So there was a code, and this is why I wanted to do this, su this stuff first, because I did not want people to have to leave early to not have access to this. You also have this in the, in the pack that's coming that's over being printed right now. This was a new code called the QVECA. QVECA, K-H-U-VECA. Now, for anybody that's taken, you know, has studied this work, K-H-U is indicative of a word, the Kundara, which is the name of what they call the primal sound fields. It's called the Kundara because each of those sounds, or the, actually the vibration, the, the sound of the vibration of that particular level of the sound fields, and you have three levels of the sound fields. You have the K sound, and they kind of throw the N in because it kind of, when you say it, it kind of comes out that way, but it's actually K-H-U, and then DA, and then RA. That would be the sound equivalence of the vibrations of the primal sound fields. All right. The KHU VECA. Now, VECA codes correspond to vectors, time vectors, time coding, which we all have it in our DNA, and everything on the planet has, and everything manifest has sets of vector codes that are really how you get into a specific space-time location, because you have that location literally mathematically encoded into your body. The QVECA corresponds to the first level of the primal sound fields. There will be two more codes after this that we can't use yet because they're not activated in the planetary grids. And these have to be, they have to be, send, the frequency has to be coming down from inner Earth. These are the ones that are coming through, whoops, not up there anymore, coming through the grids from the four faces of man down from parallel to inner to here. So we can use this because this is what's beginning to activate in the planetary grids now. This QVECA code will amplify all of the other things that we've been working with as far as protection, as far as expediting DNA activation, as far as balancing DNA activation, and what this one will do that the others won't. It will begin to break up the Jehovian implants in the planetary grids and also in our bodies. So this is the one, this and the other two, that as soon as we can use them, they'll give them to us. We can use these and there's certain times where we'll use the other VECA codes that were just introduced literally in uh, Sarasota. We had the BIVECA and the TRIVECA. I don't have a Mylar with those on them, but I think, um, is there, does everybody, has everybody seen those? Okay. Yeah, I wonder if the new people have, have seen them. Okay. Yeah, all right. Let me hold that up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Well, you're going to get a copy of it. It's coming in the... The, there's like 30 pages stapled together. Pages? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're coming. I'm not going to leave you like, you know, trying to remember all this stuff and trying to, you know, scribble down notes. There's at least, you know, 30 pages of stuff coming, including these things. All right, but before, in Sarasota, Florida, they just introduced these. This was called the BIVECA code, and that was the TRIVECA code. What the BIVECA code does is it plugs you into the D12, D13 
space. So it anchors, you're already running when you're doing Maharata frequency, when you're running the Maharic seal, you're already running D12 frequency. This takes the step up in to density 5, where you begin making the D12-13 connection. This one takes you to, through D13-14 and from 15 up into the beginning of the sound fields. And this one takes you from the first level of the sound fields, the Q, the, um, Q level of the sound fields and begins to make the bridge into the next level of the sound field. So literally, by using these codes, and again, they're mathematical codings, they correspond to what scalar wave templates are doing in your body and in the planetary grids. This is how we very, very quickly expedite mo building those creation currents all the way down. And I think I can use, there's a graph in here someplace that I can, it will help to s illustrate what I'm talking about somewhere. I don't know if I have it in here or not. It's the one that has the 15-dimensional time matrix with the thingies coming down, the oh, currents coming down. Is that over there? No, I don't think it's over there. Yeah, wait, that's it. No, it's not there. Let me see if I can find this or not. I wasn't planning on using this one. No. No, the one that goes into the 15-dimensional time matrix. Okay, hold on a second. I'm not seeing, I can't even see these. Though. See if you can find anything that had. Oh, okay. wait a minute. I think I just found it. There we go. Divine intervention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, for we're going to learn by before five o'clock how to use this. They literally just gave this to me, and with these notes: one, chakra eight, thyroid; two, tailbone, D12 access; three, heart chakra; fourth chakra; and four, pineal. Now I said, okay. <laughs> what do we do with them? <laughs> All right, that's good. They said we'll tell you when we get to the workshop. So we're going when we get into using this code. These are the areas that we're going to affect, and it has something to do with. You can draw it on the body, and they didn't tell me where the best place is yet. And I'm hoping it's not um, at the pineal because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, definitely get the reputation as being a cult. If everybody's walking around with this funny little thing on their head, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the tailbone one might be a little hard to do. <laughs> this is like a code that you have to have a friend to help with. <laughs> um, the heart chakra may be the easiest one. They're, they'll let me know. He's not going to let me know yet. Be be like as we move through some other stuff and come back to this, they'll let, we're going to they're going to run us through actually a meditation with it. Now you can use this with or without doing the salutations and things. You need to activate the the Maharata current, you know, the D12 current. Which if you if you use the Maharic seal technique, if you notice there are several techniques for the people who've been following this. First was the real long one. That by the time if you can stay awake to the time you get done, you deserve a medal. Right? <laughs> That's the one that programs the thing into the DNA, so your DNA remembers that it knows how to do this. Once you use that for a while, it's like it starts to remember. Your body starts to remember. So then there was like the quick seal, the Maharic quick seal, which was still too many steps to try to remember, but it was a whole lot better than the whole bunch of them that was in the first level. We'd start using the quick seal. At this point, we have enough support in the race morphogenetic field because enough of us have been running the Maharata current, where we can do the, uh, I like to call it the insta seal. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, it still doesn't mean, just because we can get an insta seal, doesn't mean that you never ever do the techniques with the steps again. Because eventually, if you just do the insta seal, you're not going to pull up as much frequency when you do that. Okay? You won't get as much D12 in. So it is still worth, you know, at times, you know, once or twice a week, do at least the quick seal, and once or twice a month, do at least the long version. Even if you just put it on a tape and, you know, go to sleep with it. Your body consciousness is still listening, so you can, like, use it subliminally if you want to. The quick seal is really cool. <coughs> what I do, and what you can do, is simply ask your avatar self, say, okay, what number star do I use? Because we started with the Hierophant symbol, which was a flat six-pointed star David. That was that would br release certain amounts of D12 frequency. We've moved up, and I, I, there's a lot of people using different numbers as far as how many points on that star, and it's also gone three-dimensional. Where we started with instead of a six-point flat star that we're vi in visu you know, visu visualizing. I can't talk today. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, we we start with like a 12-point star that's three-dimensional, and this is where you find it becomes interesting to try to visualize because you're kind of going. One, two, three, four. What's on the other side of that? <laughs> if it's three-dimensional, right? So what you do is you give the intention of the number, and it literally just becomes like a ball of light. 
at, with, you know, rays shooting out. We've gone up to like, I, what, I forget what the last we used, Michael. What was that? It was like, no, we, we've been playing. Um, what was it, like 9,000 something? <laughs> yeah, I forget what the exact numbers were, but we've been increasing progressively. And every time you increase how many points are on that star, what you're doing is giving instructions for more subharmonics of the D12 to be activated in the body. So you, at this point, there's enough support in the planetary grids, enough D12 here that we can begin to let our own higher self have a little, you know, ha have some in input in it. So if you want to run the, the Maharata current, ask and see if a number comes to you. What number should I use? Most often, it'll be increments of 12. You know, 12, 24, 36, 48, you know, all the way up into thousands and thousands sometimes. It doesn't always have to be. It may be that you need to get some of the smaller frequencies, but you're not ready yet for the other half of that 12 or whatever. Let a number come to you. And start with anything that's over 60, because at this point, everybody can handle at least a 60 code. Hierophant is what they call it. That's the official name of the thing you use to activate your Maharata. Okay? And the quick, the insta seal would simply be invi visualizing it here in the pineal, giving it the command, like a little ball of light that has all these rays shooting out that you know is going to have, a n the number of rays will be the number you're going to give it. All right, and even if you can't see them because they all blur into a mess when you try to visualize them, even when you try to draw them, they blur into a mess. Try 9,000 points. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> you see here the next, next Tuesday trying to just count them and visualize it. Just simply hold it there. Take an inhale breath and hold it for a second because it builds a little bit more charge when you hold it. And then throw it down into Earth's core. Inhale it up just to below your feet. Don't pull it all the way up yet just to blow your feet, and then push out your Maharak seal with it. Feel the star thing still rotating in, in um, yeah, it's at 12, six inches, six inches below the feet. And feel your uh, disc around you. Take a few more breaths, just bring more frequency up. And you're not going to bring the frequency up into the body yet. The idea is to get that shield activated first. So you went down, up only to where the Maharak shield is. And spread it out. A few more breaths. You, you can like do it just with just one, but you'll strengthen how much D12 current you get the more breaths you use. So you can just, and remember, you're still blowing it out beneath your feet. You're expanding the disc around you. Once you get to a feel like, yeah, I can feel it there. There's a, some frequency there. Then simply put your attention back on the star that's in the center of the heart shield and pull it up to the heart chakra and blow it out this way. Take another breath to with that, you're actually actually activating another shield that comes out this way, your Turic shield that goes with your Oversoul level. That'll kick in your Telluric shield down here into activation. And then just inhale, and it went all the way out the top of your head to the 14th chakra, and then and you'll see it go into a burst of light and anchor at the 14th chakra. You can get to the point where you can do it really, really fast. You just simply, you know, if you come up on something, if you, if you start to feel funny, if you walk into a room and there's some funny energy there, simply... <laughs> <laughs> it really does. <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah, now, if you try to do that and you've never done Maharak Seal before, you're not going to hardly get any frequency coming up. Because you need to train your body to, to know what it's doing with these frequencies. It's been like 200,000 years since bodies on this planet knew how, you know, remembered how to do this. But it becomes, it, it's really nice since everything is being accelerated. We don't have time to stand at a site for a half an hour doing 26 steps to get our Maharak seals up, right? <laughs> so fortunately, there's enough frequency in the planetary grids and in the indigo and human morph field at this point where we can just run the insta seal and we will get enough of a pillar to move through whatever we have to. Now, that pillar is not going to last a real long time because you didn't get a whole lot of frequency. When you take time to even do the quick seal, and we have the long seal, the quick seal, now the insta seal. If you do the one in the middle, the quick seal, and really just take the time to move through the steps of that. I mean, is there anybody that doesn't have that? Because it's in these books, in the field guides. You don't have that one, the, the quick seal technique? Okay. Okay. They had, 
Okay, because I know they come with just about everything at this point. <laughs> I think they're in Cathara and they're in that now, and um, they're going to be in the Voyager's 2 book, second printing that's coming out. So if there's anybody that doesn't have, like, the instructions for the quick seal, um, we can, we can eat, like, we'll probably send them to you or maybe they're figure out website. something to get to the thing down the street that prints. The website. It's on the website. It is on the yeah. website now? Okay. I haven't even got the chance to look at the website. Yeah, so that's good. As long as you have the, the quick seal, you can begin working with that. And it's still worthwhile for people who really care about how much frequency can I generate. It's still worth once in a while doing the long version of it. Use it as a meditation. You know, put it on before you go to sleep or before you take a nap or something. Or, you know, like while you're under a hair dryer at the hairdressers or something like that. Just put it on and listen to it. You know? Okay. You need to use that frequency to run any of these codes. They're not going to do anything if you haven't activated the Maharic seal. You can play with the, the codes all you want. And this is kind of neat. It's like a, a built-in safety. It's like, oh gosh, if these seals are so, if these symbols are so, you know, so important, why, how can you let them go out to the general public? Because the Illuminati will get them. Yeah, they will. But you can't use them unless you run a Maharic seal. It requires having a 12-strand template to run a Maharic seal. Now, they can get that template by having a Melchizedek ordination where it's transferred to them from somebody who has it. But if they are not running their full D12 Christos current, they cannot use the symbols. They can play with them, but they're not going to do much of anything for them. There are certain ones that you can bend light through and you can make messes with, but they can always be reset by using the Maharic seal. That's why, at this point, there's no, we, we don't do closed circle stuff, you know, where we don't let other people know. I mean, if you want to become a Freemason, it'll probably take you about 50 years before you get to, like, level 33 is where they, that's their last level they really talk about, you know, is having, where it says inner circle, inner circle, inner circle. And by the time you get here, you might figure out what the first five levels were about, but you're not, you know, they hold, they hoard information. They keep it away from the public. They do that on purpose. And there's lots of soci societies like that. The Toth schools all worked like that. You'd find, you'd read a passage in one of their things, and you'd find at level one, it meant one thing. At level two, you'd be told, this word means that, this word means that, this word means that. And you'd find out the thing meant a whole different thing. Interestingly, the Bible is written that way as well. Okay? These were ways of coding information where it would, where other people could see it, but they wouldn't, it, you'd put it right under their nose and they wouldn't know what it was. We, ha we are not doing that. We are simply putting it in, well, English is the only language I know how to translate in, but we're putting it in English clear as it's coming off the plates. And it's because the stuff that's most powerful that we're going to be using, the people who really care are going to be using, can't be used unless you're running D12 Christos frequency, which means unless you are willingly entering a state of Christ consciousness by bringing your Maharata current through, you're not going to be able to do damage with those codes. So it's kind of nice. We don't have to play the game of, you know, the mystical school game that it takes you forever to get to the center to find out what anybody is really doing. It's all open, you know, to the public. Now what we're doing when we use codes like these, we're building this bridge of frequency. Okay. Now this is a diagram of a 15-dimensional time matrix. Most of you have seen this. If you've had any of the classes before, you're probably so sick of looking at this one. <laughs> because this is like this 15-dimensional time matrix shape, this oval shape, is used to display all sorts of information and show relationships and things. Now, what this one does is it shows you have your primal sound fields out here. Okay? That's what these three outer bands are, called the triadic, the polaric, and the acadic level, the primal sound fields. You come in here. This is where sound begins to become light. Dimensions... 13, 14, and 15. That's called density f uh, 5. And it's the... It, your, the density 5 is a waveform. It's antimatter, A-N-T-E matter. And it's a waveform where, like, consciousness, when it comes in, first consciousness becomes sound vibration. Then it begins to interact with itself and becomes light. This is antimatter light fields. They're standing light fields, like lights that never go off. All right? They're just constant fields of light. And these would be constant fields of dark, actually. There's no, you would not see light because it's before light occurs because you don't have the same interreactions of vibration, um, points of vibration. What creates from sound to light is you have sound, units of sound, which are fixed points of vibration. And they begin to interact with each other by syncopating those vibrations. So there's a syncopation factor that takes place where things that are just standing units of sound here start to 
interact with each other because there's a pulse that's sent through. And you could call it the breathing rhythm of source. There is a pulse that is sent through as consciousness moves. It's like the inhale and outhale. There's a pulse to the consciousness of source that actually keeps these primal light and sound fields and everything else in them in motion. So it is the pulse from source, this consciousness, that takes these vibrations and begins to make them move to where they interact with each other and they interact with each other following very specific mathematical geometrical interrelationships that create the bending of frequency which creates light. So you have your primal sound fields, primal light fields. Now, these primal sound fields are what collectively are called the kundare currents. They are the primal sound currents, the first currents emanating from source, the first levels of individuation from source. Source isn't somewhere over here away from this. Source would be the boundaryless thing all around here as if the paper went off for forever. So this is taking place within source. This is why it can never be separate from God because there is no place to go besides in here. If you're in manifest form, you have to manifest through the structure. This is the structure of dimensionalization that allows for consciousness to bend itself in ways where it becomes light and sound that interacts in ways that allows a three-dimensional hologram to be created. So we're all in a hologram that we create ourselves. Now, we are in our at one moment with source all the time. There's always a part of ourselves that are here, up in, beyond, before sound. There's always a part of ourselves here in the primal sound fields. That part is called our ascended master levels of self. There are three levels of that. And they are existing with us simultaneously. This is why those, any, any systems out there that teach you to follow and give your power to somebody else because they're more important than you. Now, there might be somebody that has learned more and, and grounded more information here than you have right now. But we are all equal when it comes to this because we all have these simultaneous stations of identity. Even once upon a time, the fallen angelics, they have their levels up there. What they have done in the Phantom Matrix is sever their connection down here at D11. So they cannot access those primal sound fields or the levels of consciousness that go with them. And it creates, it's a distortion in consciousness that makes them feel very alone, so they try to take energy from everything, you know, uh, other systems because they feel they don't have any, because they feel they're not connected. This is, with, with people that have this, the 12-strand template, what it means is you have the ability to, you're down here in these dimensional fields, to have these currents connect through the primal light fields and into the primal sound fields, which means you have the ability if you activate it in your templates. Now, humans on a 12-strand can bring in 12 dimensions of consciousness, one for each strand template, okay? Indigos, if they have 48 strands, can bring in the whole thing from the Akkadic level down. Indigos that have, I think it's, uh, it's 37 down to something or other, um, I forget, I forget what the numbers are. We, I haven't taught that yet, but basically 24 to 48 strands will take you from where you can go through here or up through there. It means you can anchor that consciousness in the body if you choose. also means you can run that consciousness, that frequency, into the planetary grids. All right, this is what we're going to be doing. What indigos are going to be doing in round tables is running that whole current of energy. What 12-strand humans are going to be doing is running their D12 Maharata current. Because when we look at the dimensional structure, primal sound fields, primal light fields, then we get into here, dimensions 12, 11, and 10. That is density 4. It's called pre-matter. That's the divine blueprint. That's where you start to have large amounts of form individuation, where you're not just in the primal light fields as waveform anymore. This is where forms, where you start to take on form. It's a pale silver liquid light is what it looks like. It kind of reminds you of liquid mercury that can take on forms and then melt them down and take on other forms. The founders' races are made of this stuff. We are the founders' races there. This is one of the things that is kind of interesting about the whole game of creation here. We have simultaneous incarnations in other time vectors, right? We have them all the way down, because to get down here, where we are right now, experiencing reality, implies that you've had to leave or park parts of your consciousness in each station. We all have a level of ourselves that's part of the Christos founders races. So the founders aren't somebody separate from us. So we go, how do we know you're our founders? You know, the founders we're talking about are the ones, <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that we, we've literally come out of them. Just like with the fallen angelics, they'll have like a, a dark avatar collective up in D11, and it fragments itself down and creates races and individuals. 
and sets of individuals. And then when they get down here, then they can look back up and say, well, what if I don't like you? I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> it, most, most beings that have their templates intact and their consciousness is balanced have a good relationship with the parts up here. But down on this planet, we have been cut off from our awareness of this because our DNA, it's all, it all connects to the DNA template. If you have 12 strands of DNA, but you only activate three, how many dimensions are you going to perceive? Right, right. If you have six strands activated, how many dimensions would you perceive? Right. It's that simple. So if we have three strands, and we do have three strands activated now, the chemical components that are in what our scientists look at and say, oh, that's a two-strand, it has a double helix. A double helix equals one strand. You will not see them separate and spread out like this. We have three strands worth of coding right now, chemical coding in the DNA template, chemically. So they are three overlaid strands. Imagine what the chemical coding might look like once we have 12 strands activated. And what's interesting, there's a, I keep telling Michael, I said, you know, I think it'd be really cool. It's, it's not practical, but it would be really neat to be able to see when we really get the frequency running and we're doing rounds or something, we can feel that frequency for the round tables running. If somebody did a DNA test right there, like took a sample there of the DNA, right, and then waited till later, we're just like hanging out watching television or whatever, and took a sample of the DNA there, the chemical DNA, I wonder if it would show already, because I think it would. But you'd have to catch, you know, the frequencies when they're active. Because when we activate 12 strands or more if you're indigo during round tables, they don't just flash on and stay on and your chemicals go crazy because your body would like literally morph before your eyes and you'd probably be about 12 feet tall and you scare yourself to <laughs> death. <laughs> and you'd probably blow up your matter form is what you'd do. But what they do is they give little bursts of the frequency. And I think at this point, I, because I felt the frequency in groups increasing, the more we've done this, every round table seems to carry more frequency with it. And that means we're getting closer to hitting critical mass where that frequency in the template is going to start making differences in the chemicals. Because ideally, if we want to ascend, actually be able to take our bodies through a stargate, we have to be able to change the chemicals in the body. And that's what happens when the templates activate properly. There are certain parts of the DNA that science hasn't found yet. They, they found parts of them, and they call them junk DNA. They have, um, in, what are they called? Intron sequences, I believe, are the, they call them intron sequences of DNA. They're dormant sequences. They don't produce amino acids or, the, or protein bases. So they're considered junk, like they're not doing anything in there. These have a purpose. There's also spacer DNA. And it, it operates, it's the same type of thing, but it's between, I think, different genes where the intron sequences are within a single gene. They're these blank spots, literally like blank spots in a pattern. And these blank spots, if the DNA is working properly, do stuff when frequency hits the DNA template. They would create certain chemicals that would bring into life something called the um, turnstile DNA sequences. Turnstile DNA sequences emerge as chemical changes within the hydrogen bonds. Now, DNA strands have, you know, one helix, then another helix, then these little ladder rungs that go across. The little ladder rungs are held together by hydrogen bonds, ha hydrogen atoms that are, are bonding them together, and it's a very weak bond. When the body begins a transmutation process, those hydrogen bonds start to change. They're, the hydrogen atoms start to become something else and they create, they literally, another sequence of DNA chemicals comes into activation. They're called turnstile DNA because it allows the body the chemical realities that allow it to switch time vectors because that's what your body needs to be able to do right now. It's phase locked into the timeline, which is a rhythm of frequency pulsation that goes with the Earth. So there is, the, when the hydrogen bonds in the DNA begin to change, they create a substance called celestiline which is an element that our scientists don't know about because they haven't seen anybody turn on their, their uh, tur uh, turnstile DNA. These are physical changes that are going to be happening. If we get to the point where we can actually go through the gates and not blow ourselves up, <laughs> our bodies would have to go, and it goes rapidly. These things, that for a certain level of frequency hits in the DNA template, you hit a critical mass of frequency with a minimum of six strands because you have to activate strands one, two, and three, and then the harmonic above, strands four, five, and six. And what begins to happen is the templates start to do braiding. They start to braid because the fire codes in between them release. I'll show you some diagrams in a minute. The fire codes release. Strands one and two braid. Strands one, two, and three braid. And they progressively braid up to the next level. This creates the turning on 
of the turnstile DNA within the hydrogen bonds. And that begins a chemical change in the hydrogen bonds that sets off chemical changes within the whole DNA chain. These chemical changes begin to affect how molecules themselves, how atoms, start to behave. There's a fascinating process by which um, the protons that are inside of the nucleus and the electrons that are outside, the electrons actually reverse polarity, turn into protons and pull into the nucleus, and we begin to fuse with our antiparticle double. Literally, where they are and where we are, which is 45 degree shift and uh, 90 degree shift in angular rotation of particle spin, our particles come together. And it creates, literally, hyperspace of the particles. There's a little bit of stuff left that can't make the transmutation process. And the, the, all of these things are set in motion by the DNA creating the chemical celestiline. Celestiline begins to change how all of the chemicals and hormones in the body work. It, effect, it, it starts to change the way the thyroid works. It changes the way the brain works. And it allows for the body matter to go through the process of shifting timeline sequences. And it happens like that. Gosh, in the old days, we used to be able to literally, you know, we knew where the portals were, you go, oh, bye, you know, boom, and you pop up someplace else. It was that fast. Your body would literally turn into a flash of light, and actually it turns into sound. <laughs> this is called going into Merkaba, okay, where the Merkaba vehicle fits in is these are the energy fields that your body literally turns itself into to get itself from one space-time place to another. So there's a whole fascinating process that we go through as we, you know, progressively work with these currents. How the DNA activates is the templates get hit with progressively higher sequences of frequency in the right order, preferably, because if it's not in the right order, that's when you can get hurt. That's when people run kundalini energies and they don't do it the right way and they don't clear the DNA template. They can have horrible experiences with it. Well, our programs make sure you, are, you understand, first of all, what a kundalini energy is, what it's connected to, realizing the DNA template has to be handled with the D12 frequency or it's not going to be clear enough to run kundalini. Now, these are the currents, the frequency currents from the primal sound, primal light, pre-matter fields. Down here, you get into the etheric matter fields, semi-etheric matter fields, and down here are the matter fields that we're in. These are literally frequencies of energy that progressively activate in the DNA template that once the critical mass of them activates, that level of the strand templates will activate, and then that level of the turnstile DNA will turn on, and that will affect that level of the hydrogen bonds. So there's a whole process. It's not like you have esoteric over here and physical over here and there's nothing in between. They go very much together. This is part of the missing links that are in a lot of metaphysical teachings. They'll make all sorts of promises about God and ascension, and if you're good and you do certain things and follow this book or that book, you're going to get to heaven. Well, heaven happens to be being able to go into any of the other reality fields, the house of many mansions. This is the house of many mansions. There are many, many reality fields that we can experience. What mastery is, what Christ consciousness is, is getting to the point where you have your 12 strands turned on, where you have a, all of this consciousness available to you, and you have the ability, you have mastery over those dimensions of frequency, which means you can choose to put yourself in any place you want. You can also choose to put yourself simultaneously in several places. People that get good, even if you get up to six-strand activation, you can start playing with things like bilocation, where you can actually make a hologram of your body, put part of your consciousness in it, and send it someplace else. There's all sorts of things that avatars learn to do. And what we all are are sleeping avatars. And if we're indigos, indigos are not just avatars. They're sleeping rishi, which go up into this area, or they're sleeping ascended masters, and we just need to wake up. So all the processes we're involved with are the process of getting this part of ourselves back by running these creation currents. When we do roundtables, what we're doing is progressively building this chain of frequency. Right now, most people are running on these frequencies, the one, two, three frequency. It's called the telluric frequency. All right. There's another set of currents here that are called the duratic currents, which are the dimension four, five, and six currents. Most people don't have those turned on at all because their, their DNA is not activated to the fourth or higher strand. Then up here, you have the... Um, Mm, Turic currents, D7, 8, and 9. These are the currents when we teach Cathara healing. We teach you to run frequency. We teach you how to open the seals in the body so you can get these currents in. Every healing system on the planet right now doesn't do that. What they're doing is using the telluric currents down here. So they get moderate effects, but you're not going to get permanent and lasting effects. The reason we can use these higher currents is because we're using the D12 frequency now that it's available on planet. We can use that to release the seals in the body that allow the frequency to come through. When we do round tables, we are creating a pillar. Each one of us becomes a pillar of light and sound. And that's what we leave behind. After we leave a round table, like the round table you did this morning, 
Now, you may not see anything out there on the D3 level, but if you looked at it from D6, or if you were coming, if you were looking at it from, say, the astral plane, it would look like, literally, the design that you see on the little diagram that you know shows the the little circles, you know, the, the geometrical shape, you would see pillars of standing light left where everybody stood. Yeah. And what those pillars do is they don't just stand there on the ground, they go into the ground and they connect into the Earth's core. And they send frequencies out and make all sorts of little tiny tributary lines out into the grids that they're connected to. Now, if you were running reverse current like the people who were being trained in the Anunnaki mode are doing, what your pillars of reversed light and sound would do would go in and trigger activation of their APIN systems. What our pillars do is they go in and trigger activation of the APIN systems and the natural seals. So actually the seals start to release, they help us to activate our seals, we run more current and it helps the seals to release more and we get to balance the frequency by doing it. We're doing major work with energy when we do these round tables. It was kind of funny because they just gave us the, these technologies not too long ago, it was this year that they gave them to us. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's good to move them around too, but what in, I remember times when we used the round tables. I have like kind of postcard memory snaps from when we used to do them. And we, I mean, there'd be thousands of people doing them. It was awesome watching like a field of like 5,000 people doing sets of round tables all together. But we would do them very often all in the same place. You don't have to, but you keep building and building and building. If we wanted to set areas where, say, we wanted to be able to take a whole bunch of people through, that might not have the DNA activation level we, you know, where they could normally go through. We would create a really strong field and it creates like a, a Q zone field but a major one. And it would create a support field for people. We could then take people through that didn't have DNA activation. They couldn't stay but they could like go in to visit inner earth or something like that. In the old days before they had to literally shut down the, the portals to inner earth because they were being invaded all the time by you know, the fallen angelics. We would do things like this. Round tables had very, very practical purposes. There's, you know, it's kind of funny. It reminds, me, it reminds me of the idea. I saw a little film one day about a, a guy who was living out on the land, and he made his own electricity. And he made his own electricity by sitting on a stationary bicycle <laughs> and pedaling away and pedaling away. And if he did this for so many hours a day, he'd generate so much power that could be stored, right? Well, in the old days, we didn't sit on bicycles and pedal. We would do round tables every so often. And what it did was there was literally a global network of electricity that w it works different than the electrical currents do here. We were able to generate a standing field of electricity that could be drawn on. You could literally use your, there, there were times when if you needed light, you would simply either pull it from inside of you and pop it out and have a little light ball or hang one out in front of you, or you could literally run systems. We didn't have light bulbs in those days. We didn't need light bulbs in those days because you could literally fix pillars of sound that would bring in as much frequency as you wanted from the standing light field that was created in the atmosphere. So we would literally do round tables just like, you know, you have generation plants that burn coal and stuff to, well... It was just us. We would simply do our dances every once in a while, and you have a big group get together, and they would do it, and it would poof, and it would like leave a whole huge amount of energy that could then be directed through crystalline technologies into usable energy forms, free energy forms. So when we do roundtables, this is just the beginning of an awesome, awesome level of technology, a technology that is a Christos technology that doesn't require artificial things that mess up other things without knowing it, it's a natural technology. It's also the way that eventually we will be able to evolve ourselves back into what we originally were. The angelic human form was an immortal form. It was not a form that death was natural to. Death is not a natural condition for human bodies. Human bodies have 12-strand minimum DNA templates. Anything with 12-strand DNA template is meant to ascend. It's meant to take its body out of here when it's done. We've been stuck here for so long because the grids have been messed up, which messed up our DNA and our bodies. So when we, there's a lot of exciting stuff. We learn scary stuff about, oh my God, the Illuminati's doing this and they're trying to suck us into these two black holes and it's like really right down to the wire right now. And it's like, yeah, it is a crisis situation. <laughs> but we have the answer to the crisis. So it's not a crisis where you have to go collapse and have like get, get really scared. And you need to take it seriously. 
or then you might have to go into the other reaction because nobody will do anything and it will not go pleasant. But there is so, a huge amount of data on the other end of this that once we get through these challenges, there's no turning back once this stuff is released on the planet. Once this knowledge is out, whoever's left standing is going to be able to learn it. And this is the kindergarten level. Right. We've, we can do amazing things with it. So there's a lot of happy things to think about, too, as far as what we're moving into. When we're working with the techniques, with the symbols, we're working with these frequencies right here. We're building that bridge. When I talk about the Antankarana, D9 down to D1. That's the Antankarana right there. It's nine dimensional, dimensionalized levels of frequency. When we get up to here, D10, 11, and 12 to collectively are the Maharada. So when you run the pale silver of the D12, and it's actually D12 and D11 combined, you're running the full Maharada because it'll bring the D10 in with it. Up here you have the Kirache primal light fields. And up there you have the Kundare primal sound fields. It's progressively building your body's ability to hold this pillar of light and sound. And as you do, you bring more and more of your self-awareness in because you have portions of yourself that you're literally, you're made of frequency. Even here, your consciousness that you're aware of, this is mostly your D3 consciousness. As far as the self that you know, that you have right now, I say, okay, I look in the mirror, this is me. That's your D3 consciousness. Now, you also have your D2 consciousness, which most people on D3 don't really know it too well yet. They're just getting to know it. That's what we call the emotional body. That's a part of your focus that's stationed in the D2 frequency bands, and it's perceiving in its way and understanding in its way. And we have some genetic problems right now that make it very difficult for that part of you to communicate with this part of you fully clearly, so we get a feeling. And sometimes we don't know what that feeling is or what to do with it. Then we have another part of ourselves, the D1 level of self. That is literally your subatomic self, your molecules, the elements your body is made out of. This is you too. This is a part of your consciousness that takes on that form. Most people don't realize they're thinking as, um, as subatomic particles as well as thinking here. As we progressively integrate the higher frequencies, it loosens up the relationship between those separate levels of our bodies where we start to know our emotional selves as ourselves and we begin to know our physical selves as ourselves as well. It's really neat when you can flip into microvision. There's a thing that comes when you start to integrate where you can start to literally see things from the microscopic perspective because you're starting to integrate your D1 level of consciousness. I flip into that sometimes and sometimes you're better off not because you can see all the bacteria on stuff and if your D3 mind knows it doesn't want to eat stuff that's contaminated or has bacteria on it, um, it can be a real nuisance. Like you can see mold before it's visible. Things like that. You know, you go in the refrigerator, try to get a slice of bread, take it out, and your microvision kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> microvision will be very useful as we move through the challenges that these times present. Because if we know it's there, <coughs> we can set the intention that we would like to develop this skill as soon as possible. If you get the ability to be able to see the microscopic level without a microscope, you'll be able to look at water and see if it's contaminated or not. You'll be able to look at food, and this will scare you to death when you see what food looks like at, from that level. Now, because what we see, if it's the organic stuff, it's washed in dirty water, you'll see all the little things roaming around on it. You know what it reminds me of? Do you ever see those photographs, and they use them for like vacuum cleaner ads to show you all the things that the vacuum cleaner is going to suck up that you can't see? And they take like dust particles, like little tiny dust particles, and they blow them up like a million times. And they look like these monsters, you know? <laughs> they have little dust mites that look like, like really horrible things from outer space that are going to eat you alive. So you do have a level of your consciousness that can perceive these things. You also have a level that can perceive in every one of those dimensions. So as we work with the round tables, we're not just helping the planet. We're not just going to get those wormholes closed and finish the Christos realignment mission. We're going to find progressively more and more of ourselves. It doesn't happen overnight. It's progressive. The more you work with the energy, bringing it in, the more you work with the techniques and bring it in, the more of you, you get back. And it changes your life. When you start to make leaps, and it's always, there's a, there's a, a place you go into, and it hits... The, the, it goes in cycles, like you'll go through an activation cycle of the DNA, and you'll start to know it. If you start to get a, a period where you start to go into heat flashes, and you just notice, God, what's wrong with me? My hormones doing weird stuff or something? You know, am I, get, am I crossing that age barrier or what? You know? If you start to get little periods of where all of a sudden your muscles ache, or you're getting like little shooting pains in your bones, it won't last forever. 
Now, there are other periods where you're clearing Jehovian implants before you have the things to release them, like, like Michael and I have been doing, especially Michael. And you know, this is really hard. You know, you will feel pain in those areas. But we're, we're getting the, the symbol codes now to work with where we don't have to feel the pain. But as we work with this, there, there's real physical things you'll feel as your DNA activates. You'll feel sometimes heat rushes. Sometimes you'll feel numbness in, like... Like I, w I was getting it here, just that part of my leg would just go numb, not sitting on it for, or anything, you know, I wasn't sitting cross-legged, it would just happen to go numb and tingly. These are new portions of the axiotonal lines and the ley lines in your body, you know, your meridian lines, waking up to hold a new frequency. So there are changes that you'll feel in your body. Some people get bumps on their head. I've, I saw a few people that had that, where literally they'd either get bumps or not cysts. They would just, the skull would change a little, a little bit. The shape of the bone would change a little bit. And then it would go back down to normal after a couple of weeks. But it was reacting. The, the body reacts to the chemicals. So I think it's pretty, uh, we haven't had anybody analyze DNA. And personally, I don't think right now with who's running science laboratories and things, I would want them to analyze my DNA <laughs> because if they found out it was different than what they thought it should be, we'd all be in trouble because they'd try to put us someplace as guinea pigs. <laughs> but I, there are things that you're going to feel, and the more you work with these techniques, the more you will move into these cycles. And it is a cycle. You might go through a cycle where for like three months you're just getting these heat flashes now and then they come you don't know what they are we'll know what they are they have to do with DNA activation you might go through a cycle where you start getting not severe but you might start getting headaches you're on a pineal activation cycle if that happens you might feel pressure in the head and it'll bring on headaches sometimes you might go through a cycle where your vision goes blurry this is associated with pineal activation as well now, when we're going through DNA activation, it's not just something fun to do on weekends, you know, when you go to a workshop. It's something that everybody's going to start going through, but at least we know what it means. The people out there are going to start running to the doctor to give them medicine for heat flashes. They're going to start running to the doctor for the eye problems, for ear problems, because there's periods of time where ears do weird stuff, too. And the one that really drives me crazy is the memory. There are times, I don't know if anybody has noticed this yet, but there will be times when literally you walk from one room to the other and then you stand there and go. <laughs> and then, you know what helps with that? Literally backtrack. Go right back to where you were when you had that thought because you left it there. <laughs> okay? But you'll be doing clearing. Your cellular memory is going to be clearing as you do this. It's making room for more higher frequency and stuff that's really not pertinent to your growth. Your higher levels of consciousness are going to say, excuse me, that's going to go. And it's like, that may be really inconvenient at work if you have to remember a lot of statistics and numbers and things like that. And all of a sudden, where is that file? <laughs> you know, I know I used to know this, where did it go? So it balances out after a while. It comes down to the stuff that's important for you to know is there. And then you get to a point you, where you might get so much information coming in, you realize you just can't hold it. There's nowhere to put it in your cellular memory. What I've learned to do is to trust that whatever it is will be there when I need it. And that goes for your physical parts as well, too. Mm -hmm. If you really, really need it, it will be there. If you're going through a purging cycle and it feels awful, because some of us will, you know, there are, there are distortions in the DNA templates, miasms from the karmic imprint that we're going to be clearing progressively. But if you can realize that even though you're going through a yucky cycle, there's another part of you that knows exactly what it is, even though at that point your head is probably, you know, where you get, if your body's doing stuff and it doesn't feel good, it tends to drag your emotional body and your mental body right with it. Whereas, I'm sick of this. I don't, get me away from this. And you just want to go around, you know, and bite somebody, mostly yourself. You know, you're <laughs> like, geez, get me out of this body. If you can realize at those times, there's a part of you, your soul level, your oversoul level, your avatar level, that understands very much the discomfort you're going through. It's doing its part to help you get through this as comfortably as possible. And even if you lose focus and it made sense to you two weeks ago, but all of a sudden you don't know what the heck you're doing with your life and you don't know what to do and nothing just seems to work and you just feel like you're not connected to anything, that's a shifting place here. You're, you're moving into a higher space. And your avatar self already knows that. So it's comforting to know that there's some part of you that already got the plan. All right. Even if you don't know what you're doing, that part of you does, so you can trust it. Right? These are things that are like survival skills when you go into rapid DNA activation. And right now, it's going to be very interesting because this is one of the things I wanted to get to is rapid DNA activation. We are going through, I'm going to do the seals first. This is, you have these in your books too. This is what took me forever to compile this. this is one of the charts that took a long time. Um, this is a place that talks about the planetary seals, okay? This is a, a diagram that puts it all kind of in one place for you. 
You can probably read it better in your own uh, books because the print is offset from the one behind it on this. And I, I don't know what page it is because these weren't page numbered yet. Page four? Four. Okay. You know, you talk about you losing your memory. I, I've had so much of this happening where I'll put something down, mm -hmm. and I'll go back and just will not be there. I will rip it apart, and the next day I wake up and it's sitting in that spot. What has been happening to me? That's more than memory, usually. Yeah, I, it's happening so much yeah. this year that she thinks we're shifting. I don't know. I can't it's explain it, but I'm not losing my mind. No, you're not. You know, we, my you're not the only the one brain. that has that. <laughs> She was just describing an interesting phenomenon. I was wondering if it had to do with memory or what. She said, it's happening so often these days that she'll like, put something down and then go away, come back, and it's just not there. But then the next day it will be. I think it jumps dimensions. It does. We're going into dimensional blend now. As these stargates open, we're starting to interface with what, what are called probabilities, probable reality fields. And there's all sorts of strange things happening. Sometimes, depending on what the frequency of the thing is that you put down, it went somewhere else for a while, and then it came back, literally. But if that shift, I'm not shifting. Those well, things. you're kind of both shifting. Okay, you go into a space of frequency, and it's in a space of frequency, and you're both changing frequency, and you literally move out of each other's perception for a while. And then you go back into the same frequency again, and you're seeing each other again. It might be an object you put down on the table, but it also might be a person. Yep. It may be I mean, like half a planet's worth of people. <laughs> <My children>? <laughs> <laughs> they usually come back. <laughs> Part of My what? <laughs> Part of what we're going to be seeing as we move through this is something. It was very good that you brought up that example. Part of what we're going to be seeing as we move through this stellar activation cycle, particularly if it goes well, because if it doesn't go well, we're going to be so distracted by the mess that's falling apart around us that we're not going to have much time to enjoy the strange scenery that happens when stellar activation cycles go normal. There's some really interesting things that happen. Now, what we're going through is literally the planetary grids. All of the planetary grids aren't going to be able to make the full shift. That was known in 20,326 BC. That's when the original, what was called the Bridge Zone Project, was created. The Bridge Zone Project has three time vectors. That means the planetary shields are literally going to separate into three different areas of frequency, which is three different time cycles. There's a part that we can't stop from going into phantom. It's the part, it's connected to the part that's already in there. There's a part that's going to do the blend or anchoring through, through the four faces of man grid to the inner Earth time cycle, and there's a part that's going to link to the time cycle of this planet, but on its next harmonic up, Terra, but in the Miage time vector, which is a time vector where everything has gone all right. Their history line is different. So we're going into a, a position here, if this works, called the Bridge Zone Project. We're three tracks of time. Right now we're on one track of time. And as we move through now, it was supposed to be between now and 2017 was when this was supposed to go down. The three vectors were going to separate. One was going to go down in frequency in the phantom. One was going to go in the middle frequency band where we would begin to interface with inner Earth. And the portals would open and we would realize there's whole civilizations here and we'd start to learn a lot of stuff. And then there's another one that would go into the miage zone, which is another time vector that pops in and out of this time matrix. Um, what's going to happen, what some of this will look like, if we get far enough, which I'm, I'll say when we get far enough, because I'm not going to leave if as an option. When we get far enough in to the transitions that are taking place on this planet, there's literally going to be things that disappear permanently from each other. There are going to be groups of people, depending on where your DNA is activated. Now, the more of us that work with the really intense techniques to get our DNA activated, we're helping everybody else, there is a chance that most of us could shift into the bridge zone where we won't go into phantom. And there's only a few of us that once we get everybody into the bridge zone, then we'll like go on to the next one because that's a little higher frequency. That, re that would require like activating the DNA, I think, to full 12 strand to make a full leap to stay up in the miage vector. So there's literally going to be three reality fields that have been running together. Now, reality fields are composed of molecules that take on the form of things, people, plants, rocks, all that kind of stuff, all right? <laughs> These fields are going to separate, and we may begin to see, even in the, in the biblical story, it, it told you that you know, certain ones would li literally disappear as God took them up. <laughs> you know? Actually, they were talking about the team that's going to get hijacked by Jehovah, but 
the concept is true, all right? The concept in a stellar activation cycle that if there's a huge difference in the frequency levels of the people on the planet, which means a huge difference in their DNA activation levels, they will literally go in to three different time bands, three, di three different time continuums. And what we may begin to see, and people are seeing it already, where certain things, like she said, you know, I put something down, I go away and uh, come back, it's not there, then the next day it'll be there again. You're seeing the oscillation in frequency. You're literally, those timelines aren't fully separated yet, but they're starting to. So things are falling into this one, but then they come back in when you get into alignment with them. The whole planet's going to be going through this. So if you start to have weird things happen, like things disappear, and then come back again, and you know you didn't do it. I've had stuff appear someplace else. It is. Yeah, what's going to be really freaky is when buildings start to do it. When buildings start to do it. That's when it's going to get really interesting. Because when you go through the full, when it really starts to separate, you're re literally going to see that. Now, some of what you will see is buildings disappearing like the trade centers just did. It will appear to have an outside cause. And it does. But it's also about timelines separating. All right? So there are cover events that we will see that cover a lot of this up. But there will also be blatant events that we will see where there may come a time when we're walking down the street and we watch a part of the street disappear. But something else reappeared in its place. Like you might be aiming, I had, they showed me this once, and once was enough, but <laughs> I was walking down the street and I happened to have my daughter with me, she was an infant and I was pushing her in the, in the carriage, and we were aiming for, we were on this end of the block, we were aiming for a store that was on the, you know, the other end of the block, so I'm walking with her, and I had you know, one of the ones that communicate with me telepathically saying, okay, we're gonna show you something about time here, how time works, and it'll be many years before you understand it, but just remember this. Now I'm coming into, oh, I'm starting to understand how that could happen. I was walking, saw the store. I, I, tended, I looked over to the side. Something seemed to distract me. And I looked back, and I did one of these. It was a whole different street. And I kind of went. <laughs> and it was the same where I came from. But the, it was like other people put other businesses there in two seconds flat because the, st the store I was aiming for didn't exist there. <laughs> it was really, really bizarre. And then they flipped it back where I literally didn't see it, but I noticed, I felt like, I, I felt like I closed my eyes, but I didn't. I, they were still open, but there was like a blank. My consciousness blanked for a second, and there it was again, and I felt much better because my streak came back, because I didn't know where to go, <laughs> you know? It's like, well, well, where do I go? I'm supposed to turn right down there, and then my house is over there. <laughs> where is it? <laughs> so these are some of the weird things that happen. Yeah, you can also have, I've had little hints at it where going into a store, I remember I went into a store to buy a pack of cigarettes, and one day they were like um, $2.10, and literally, at, that was like at 8 o'clock in the morning, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they were like $3.50, and I said, so, what do they do, just put a, you know, a price hike on them, or what? She said, no, they've been this way for a month and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if you have weird experiences like this, realize you're starting to perceive the changes that the planet is going through. And we're going to see all sorts of wild stuff. But it won't be too wild and freaky if we get what are called the miage zones set, or miage fields. Miage fields are frequency fields, like a frequency blanket, that will cover this planet if we were able to get the full four faces of man grid in, like fully, fully activated, and there weren't the other problems. There would be like this blanket of what looks like pale indigo blue light that would surround the planet. You wouldn't see it with instruments here, but if you were looking at the planet from a higher dimensional frequency band, it would look like a pale blue mist surrounding the planet. That is a miage field. That is the frequencies that are going to be generated by plugging this planet's four faces in to parallel and into inner Earth and then running the primal light and sound field currents. That will create that buffer around the planet. Now, in that buffer, you will be able to maintain something called a form constant, which means the form of things that you're seeing will stay relatively constant. In other words, you're not going to watch reality melt before your eyes and turn into something else. If you remember, this is all energy and frequency, and you start moving frequency around, literally there are reality systems where you walk out your door and fall off because the road isn't there anymore. <laughs> you know? There's really some strange spaces that can happen in, in places that are messed up. Now, this place will get we probably won't have the benefit. There's not enough time, probably, we could try, to generate a full miage field blanket. It's a miage field, a try-on field. That's another word for it, try-on field or trinity field. 
because it's utilizing the three, the parallel, the inner, and the uh, and earth, to anchor the full, it's not up there anymore, Kundere and Kira.